This is kind of, this is the Thursday, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't it's okay. Start. Did we start? Yes. Okay. Hey, Mom. Um, hope you're doing well. Mom's coming in a couple of weeks. Woo! Um, so, um, so tonight we're going to do Thursday of Holy Week, which of course, well, Thursday part two, let me say that. Uh, we know that Jesus is sharing uh, a meal with his disciples, sharing the Passover meal with his disciples. At the end, we know that um, we talked about the cups, what the meaning was of the Passover meal. And now he's going according to three of the Gospels, uh, the three we're going to look at tonight. He goes from the upper room to the garden. Okay, the Garden of Gethsemane, we'll tell you where that is, and just I will tell you where that is. In just a moment. All right. First, let's look at Mark 14, 32 through 41. Mark 14, 32 through 41. Can someone read that for me, please? And they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little further beyond them, and he fell to the ground and began to pray, that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he came, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you might not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping, taking your rest? It is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is an ant. Right. Where are they? Seven. Who's involved? Jesus and his disciples. Three particular ones he calls with them to go over there. Peter, James, and John. But you recall, according to the Gospel of Luke, when he when they told him, uh, which you, if you remember, according to the Gospel of Luke, that Peter and John are the one that go find the man that's carrying the water to find enough room. Okay, so Peter and James and the Transfiguration, you know uh, that. Yeah, Peter, James, and John are the one who uh, um, go with Jesus up to the mountain from the Transfiguration. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Peter as well. Um, what did he command them to do? Stay awake. Stay awake. Pray with them. Stay awake and pray. <clears throat> Some people believe that they were drunk while they could have fell asleep. We're not to talk about that. Stay awake and pray. Uh, how many times has he approached this? Three. We know what time of uh, night this is. We know it's at night. We know it's at night. And know. that's part of um, that's part of the symbolism in, in the scripture is because we know it's at night and you know what's what's done at night. A lot of evil things are done. You know. We have light, and, and God separated from the darkness, and, and darkness is the absence of light. 
And so when we talk about darkness, we know it's void of light, it's void of God, or, or whatever. And a lot of evil things are done at night, correct? When do most people steal? In the dark. In the dark. So they can't be seen. They can't be found or seen, right? Um, so his betrayal all happens at night. Um, John is very good at this. John does a lot of things at night. When Nicodemus uh, was saved, um, when he says that you can't be born again, you know, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you've been born again, when did it happen? At night. At night. Um, at night, it's, it's this, he was void of God. He was in the darkness. John is trying to say that. Okay, uh, Matthew 26, 47 through 56. Matthew 26, 47 through 56. You want to read that for me, please? No, I'm sorry. Whoa. Sorry, 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 sorry. 36 through 45. I wrote the wrong thing down. <laughs> That's the next section. 36 through 45. Sorry about that. And Jesus went with his disciple to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go there, over there, and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell up with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is living, li willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again <coughs> found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. All right. I'm writing this a little bit because we're going to have to speak through this just a hair. It's in Gethsemane. He took Peter, and this doesn't say James and John, just the two sons of Zebedee. Uh, he says, stay awake and pray. What does Jesus pray for? And I forgot to mention this in the other one. What does Jesus pray for? Take the cup away. Yeah, take the cup away. But if it's your will... Not my will. Mm -hmm. I can't spell. That too. All right, let's look at Luke 22, 41 through 53. <clears throat> Luke 22, 39 through 46. What am I looking at? You're a week ahead of time. I think so. I think I am. Oh my gosh. All righty. Someone read that for me, please. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. So this doesn't say Gethsemane. What does it say? Mount of Olives. Okay, go ahead. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He 
He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so you will not fall into temptation. Okay, uh, this one doesn't say Gethsemane, it says Mount of Olives. It uh, doesn't mention anybody he takes up with him. Uh, again, pray that you will not fall into temptation. It doesn't say how many times he, um, he just found him asleep. It didn't say three times. Um, this time, however, again, taking the cup, we see this narrative. We say this in all three. Take the cup. Don't take this cup away from me. And this time, what was he doing? Sweating. Huh? Right. He was sweating what? Blood. blood. Sweating drops of blood. Some translations. Does anyone have a translation that just says sweating blood? Any? <coughs> So, what we see out of all three, and at least two narratives that we take away from all three, is that he warned his disciples to stay and pray and not fall into temptation, and he prays to God himself to take the cup away from him. Okay, um, this is the question... If there's, if there's one question that has been debated in Christianity forever, um, what question do you think it would be? <clears throat> Jesus really rise from the dead. Did he really die and did he really rise? Well, I, think, no. I don't know. I think that's one of the staples of Christianity. In fact, it's in the Apostles' Creed that he mm -hmm. physically, on the third day, he physically rose from the dead. Now, there are a couple of... Uh, for the for the camera that didn't pick it up, uh, she said that um, one of the questions is, did Jesus physically rise from the dead? And and my answer is that that's that's a staple in at least the Orthodox uh, part of the church is that we believe that on the third day that Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead. Now there are is a group I'll say there is a group I believe there are some out there it's called the Gnostics and I don't know if you've ever heard of the Gnostics. Um, the Gnostics believed that there was no physical <laughs> resurrection, that Jesus could, uh, couldn't be human because to be human is to be sinful, and therefore basically what you saw in a, an interpretation of Jesus on earth was just a hologram. Basically a hologram. Okay? Because he could not physically take on a human body. That would, cut, that would, be, that would be sin. Um, and so therefore, if he had no physical human body, he couldn't physically rise from the dead. Um, so, but one of the questions, uh, the answer is no, by the way. So to make a long story short, that's not what I was getting at. Um, okay, what were you? I'll, I'll get to it. I think one of the, I think one of the biggest debates you're going to ever have in Christianity is did Jesus want to go to the cross? Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest debates that you could ever have in Christianity mm -hmm. is did Jesus want to go to the cross? And John he did. Okay, yes. Right, we'll, we'll get and oh by the way, thank you for saying that because I about forgot. It, is that in John none of this happened? In John, he's with them on the last supper, with them at the last supper. Of course, in John, he does not break the bread and pass the wine. He passes the cup, drinks from the cup. What does he do instead? He washes their feet. Um, and in John, he begins what we know as priestly prayers, where he play, he prays for him, he prays for his disciples. He prays for future believers. 
And then you get into the betrayal of Jesus, which we will go into in just a little bit. Yes? Why did he take the cup away from the table? What is the symbolism with the cup? Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll give me just a second. Yes? Isn't that showing that Jesus was human? That's his human. Yes, body. yes. And, yes. and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Exactly. Is, I think if we... Just take 10 seconds and, and just think your, uh, to yourself, does Jesus want, and I'll talk about the cup in just a minute. Uh, does Jesus want to go to the cross? Now take about 10 seconds and formulate your answer. Think about why you say. Okay. How many people say yes, he wanted to go to the cross? How many people say no? See, it's a huge debate. It's, 50, it's literally 50. Well, when, 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 I was, wait, 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 wait. When I was contemplating this question, I said, well, as the Son, as God, because He's human and God, as God, He wants to. Yeah. As man, His human nature is saying, yeah, yeah. I don't want to do this. Right. But He is God. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's one answer is uh, that, and, and this is a really good point by Sherry, is that we, we, we might see this duality of human and God right now. Is that his human side is taking the lead, so to speak. And maybe not so much the godly side. And we're going to talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, Peter, what were you going to say? The other thing is that if I took all the sins of the world, okay, it would be truly just. But you say, so you say, so you, know? uh, you say, yes, he's just struggling. Yes, he wants to go across. He's struggling with the human side. You <coughs> say, yes, and the burden <coughs> is great. It's just think of, you know, just, just think about all the things that are going on. Yes. My more point may be that he sensed that's a good word that man would never believe if he didn't go. Mm -hmm. That he had to go in order to make a statement. Right. Okay. You're saying yes. Uh, he has, and but he's realizing he has to go. Okay. That is a very good point as well. All three are very, very good. Because this is where we get to the crux of the argument. And a lot of people still today say, no, he didn't want to go on the cross. We can tell that he didn't, he didn't want to go to the cross. Well, first of all, I, you have to think about the argument to, you know, there, there was prophecy to fulfill. And part of the fulfillment is to die. Okay? That's part of the New Testament prophecy. I'm sorry, the New Testament fulfillment, what the Old Testament prophesies about. Born of a virgin. Um, he goes through all this stuff. Okay? He dies on a cross. That is part of that's the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. Now, let me give you a little geographical uh, outline. Okay, this is like the worst drawing ever. Just work with it. Um, Jerusalem, pretend the solid line is a wall on the perimeter. It's divided into an upper city, lower city. You have a temple somewhere up, up in the north. Jesus goes from the upper room. We, I believe it was in the lower city, what we think. And he goes into this, this whole area right here, this dotted line. Mount of Olives. Within the Mount of Olives... There's the Garden of the Simmons. Luke is not wrong when he says Mount of Olives. It's the geographical location he's right. But this is more specific. There's a Garden of Gethsemane. Garden of Gethsemane has these massive olive trees. And in fact, they've done some carbon dating on these olive trees, and they believe that some of these olive trees are, are upwards of 3,500 years old. They're still some of the oldest trees on earth. 
Now, Jesus is in the garden in a place called Gethsemane, which literally means the pressing of oil and wine. Gethsemane literally means, in the Hebraic, Arabic. <laughs> Arabic, Hebraic, what is that? <laughs> I need sleep. The pressing of oil and wine. Okay? Now. What does oil Major, mostly oil can sometimes be wine, by the way. What does oil, or if you're in the South, what is oil? Um, anointing. Exactly. Anointing. Anointing for a king, as we saw in David. Anointing for burial. I'm sorry? Burial. Burial, right? Anointing for healing. Healing. James says, if there are any of you sick among you, let the elders anoint you with mm -hmm. oil. Alright? So <clears throat> I will give you my story because I think it sums it up. Does anointing I won't tell you my story in just a minute. Does anointing, freedom, and happiness, are, let me back that up. Is anointing, the words anointing, freedom, and happiness, happiness synonymous? No. No? Anyone else want to take a guess? Is anointing, freedom, and happiness synonymous? It can be. It can be. Okay, uh, some scholars believe that this is where Jesus realized his faith. And he knows that he's the anointing one, but now it's hitting him. Alright? Is that anointing might be what God wants you to do. Here we go back to the human side again. It might be what God wants you to do. But it's not necessarily what you want to do. Hasn't he been telling them all along, though, that he's going to die? And John, and John especially, okay. tells him he's going to die. Um, son of man must be handed over. But because you, well, let me back this up. Because you know you're going to die. Doesn't mean you want to. Doesn't mean you want to die. In June of 2009, I am an associate pastor at my home church. I live a mile from the church in my home, my, my land that grandfather gave me, put a house on there, and I had it made. <clears throat> had everything I wanted. And for about a week, until this happened, I felt depressed. I felt sick. I didn't want to eat. And then one day, I'm in my living room alone. I just left the office. And I fell to my knees and wept. Because I realized that I was called. God had called me for a special purpose. And I was ready to go do that special purpose wherever he'd lead me. But, leaving, but, but leading me meant that he was going to call me away from what I wanted to do. And that hurt. Okay? And the same thing here, and, and what I believe is what you said, is that because you're called to do it, and whether you want to do it, are two separate things. I knew that God had called me for the ministry. My mom said when I was eight years old, I believe you were called to be a minister, and I was mad. God, crazy. Nuts. 
But in 2009, I realized that God had called me to, to go preach the gospel, not in my own hometown, which is unscriptural, but to go out wherever He called me. And I wanted to go. I'm sorry. He called me to go, but whether I wanted to go were two separate things. Why do I want to go? I have a great house, I have great land, got great ponds, go bass fishing on time. <laughs> he called me out of comfort. He brought me to my knees. And he said, Go. And I believe it's the same thing here. He called him, he called Jesus to do something. He called Jesus to take away the sins of the world. And as Peter said, all three, three or four of you have just wonderful answers, is that the enormity and the weight of that moment with all, and, and a lot of scholars say it's because he realized, just like I realized in 2009, what it meant to get up and take up my cross and go. Jesus knew what it meant to see all those burdens and all those sins and how much He would have to endure for that. And that was too much for Him to handle. And He wanted release from that. It didn't mean that He didn't want to go. Okay? It didn't mean that He wouldn't want to go. It just means that sometimes it's just too much. And He wanted God to take it away. Well, that's why he used the term Yosemite. That's the oil press. It takes a lot of weight to press oil. A lot of weight to press oil. A lot of weight to press wine. And that was a weight to press on Jesus at the time. The world was pressing on him. Yep. As the Lord was pressing on you, you felt the weight on you from the Lord as he's feeling the weight. Right. That's why he picked that new Yosemite there just because of the oil press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also like what he said, it was not my will, but, but your will. will. And that's a very hard prayer to pray. Yeah. Because sometimes we don't know what's going to happen. No. No. I mean, nine years ago, I'm in, in my house in Midland, North Carolina. And within a year, I'm in Ashburn, North Carolina. Within four years after that, I'm having three churches in Trinity. And a year and a half after that, I'm in Anna Maria, Florida. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next, I'll be in Hawaii. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, but also, God. Is, but also, we are compared in our soul, uh, Carolyn. Sometimes our cup is compared to our soul, and um, that our our soul is is full in this cup and that God you know in the 23rd Psalm my cup runneth over is that you poured so much into my soul it's bubbling out and we're going to talk um, um, there's symbolism when Jesus dies and talks about he, some, some translation says gave up his spirit some says empty his spirit we'll talk a little bit about that it has to do with the cup as well um, we'll, we'll get more into that later if you can just bear with us um, let me go to, and I want to talk about one more thing here. It's only mentioned in Luke's Gospel, and it has to do with the burden. It has to do with the pressing. Um, it's the sweating of drops of blood. It's a medical condition called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is basically vessels, blood vessels, most of the time it happens in your face, sometimes it's in your stomach. And what happens is these vessels burst. They're just beneath the pores of your skin. They burst, and of course they come out of the pores of your skin. Again, most of the time in the face, sometimes in the stomach. In the last century, we have only heard of 10 known cases. There have been only 10 documented cases in the last century of this. And basically, it is a 
condition in which you are so overwhelmed. There is just so much physical, mental, or emotional exertion that and anxiety. What's the name? Oh gosh. It's when you're panicked. Um, you're extremely panicky. Um, you're stressed out beyond belief. That you are so burdened that your vessels can break and blood can come out where sweat is supposed to. And Luke, Luke's account says that's what happened. Is that he was so overwhelmed with grief and anguish and despair that he couldn't help but sweat blood. Uh, how many people have ever seen uh, the Mel Gibson movie? No, no. <laughs> Freedom! Freedom! Yeah. No, you mean the, uh, when he was the, the crucifixion, the passion. The passion, the thank you. The first, have, have you ever the seen the first part, part of the movie? He wasn't in that movie. Though. Where he's directed. Jesus yes. is just shaking yes. in the garden and it swims in the blood. He's saying in Arabic, let this cup pass and not my will without me. So, and, and like with, with, Sam, with Sam said, that all that burden and weight pressure, he just couldn't help do this. Let me see if I missed anything. Uh, basically, oil is used for anointing, uh, and it, but anointing does not equal pleasantry. Anointing does not equal happiness. Again, hemat hematidrosis, is sweating blood, can be uh, can be uh, attributed attributed to extreme physical or emotional stress. Again, only ten cases confirmed in the last century. Um, the, the the amount of distance from probably where he left the upper room to the Mount of Olives, or the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, is not a long trip, probably a quarter of a mile. Forgot to mention that. So not long. Wasn't long after he shared the Last Supper that he goes up to the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay. You know, it seemed like the notion that Christ knew the betrayal was going to occur had to be oppressive on his mind yep. to some degree. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great segue because we're going right into Judas, uh, the Judas' betrayal. Um, Neil, I'd like to say too that I don't I don't think Jesus was afraid to die. But I mean like I'm not afraid to die, but I don't want it to hurt. <laughs> you know, I just don't want it, I just want to if I said I'm, if I said he's afraid to die, I'm apologizing. I, I, I didn't mean to no, say he's afraid. Didn't. Okay. Um, yes, yes, I agree. I, I, I don't mind dying, but I want to be on the. I want to do it on my terms. Yeah. <laughs> no, I want to be on the 14th hole after birdie and just walk off and just collapse. You know. I mean, really? I mean, seriously? You want to do? You want to? You want to do that? Uh, you want to catch a seven-pound Mars mount and, you know, fall over. I hate to, I don't know if this is even apropos, but one of the, our neighbors in North Carolina passed away after 10 years of cancer, and she was operated on one breast and the other breast and so forth. And then the doctors came in and gave her the final word that there was no more that they could do for her. And she walked out of the room into a garden in Winston-Salem mm -hmm. at the hospital. When she came back, she had a glow. She said, oh good, I'm going to see Shelly, mm -hmm. which was her daughter who died at 31. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, I think Jesus knew, Diane knew where she was going and she would be taken care of and she would be and, I, and, and this, is, this is also a, a stage of grief. And 
being in the ministry 15 years and seeing people when they get the diagnosis of, look, you're just going to die, is that this is one of the griefs. There's, there's pressure. You can't take it. It's too much for them. And then they kind of, they're, they're at peace with it. And we see Jesus almost in this transition. Except this phase does not last very long. Okay, we got to get it. Going to, and I'm not going to get into all three Gospels, but um, let's look at Mark. 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 Hold on. We're probably just going to read Mark since we're running behind. But Mark 14, 43 through 52. And I'll get there in just a second. Y'all get your finger on it. Okay, can someone read that for me, please? Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared with him, was a crowd armed with swords <clears throat> and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teacher of the law, and the elders. How far you want to go? Uh, 52. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the name, is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of these standing near him drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. I am leading a rebellion, said Jesus. That you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Okay, hold on just a second. It actually says, am I leading a rebellion? Not, I am leading yeah. a rebellion. Yeah. Okay. Am I? Go ahead, 49. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everybody deserted him and fled a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus when they seized him. He fell naked, leaving his garment behind. The naked guy's only mentioned in Mark, by the way, and we'll talk more. Well, we don't really have to talk about it. A lot of people think it was uh, Mark, the writer of the gospel. That's kind of his imprint on the gospel itself. Uh, we can talk about the symbolism, but we got better things to do. Uh, all right. Now, Vern, you mentioned um, that maybe Jesus is grieving because of the, uh, the betraying of what Judas is going to do. Maybe in part. Maybe in part, sure. Um, so, what was Judas's role in the twelve? Twenty. Okay, Judas... Was a traitor. Okay, Jesus was a traitor. Remember Judas. Remember what we talked about the first week. What was who was he mad at? The woman. The woman pouring perfume on Jesus at Jesus' feet, right? Wasting money. Wasting money. Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Judas really never got. What was important? He really cared about money. That and how much did uh, he trade Jesus in for? Forty something. Thirty pieces of silver. Um, we might not get into this because we've got a lot of other things next three weeks. But uh, what did Jesus do after? What did Judas do after he betrayed Jesus? Himself. Judas committed suicide. Oh, yeah, he did. He couldn't take it. He actually gave back the money. Mm -hmm. Couldn't take that he betrayed him. But in this particular instance, 
Judas aligns or gets with the Jewish leaders, high priest, and he says, I'm going to deliver him to you. Again, at, we, it's not they, but it's the at night. night. At night. Everything is kind of uh, under darkness. So Judas lines up this uh, signal between them and says that the person I kiss is that man you want. Have him arrested. Well, we'll arrest him. Um, so, he comes up to Jesus, and what does he say? He calls him rabbi. He calls him rabbi, yeah. And in fact, some translations and some of the Gospels says rabbi, rabbi, which if you've seen anything in the New Testament, if you say something twice, repeat the words, it means something of great importance. Right? Like not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. These are, um, what? Barely, barely, I say unto thee. Yeah. Uh, that if you say it with twice, it's of great importance. These people who are saying, Lord, Lord, uh, will not even enter the kingdom of heaven. It's people who are like shouting, Lord, Lord, and even they won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Excuse me. So, Judas actually emphatically says, Rabbi, teacher, and this verb we see in, uh, in the Greek, when he kisses him, that verb kiss is actually a, uh, it, it, it means a symbolic kiss of that of a, of a master, excuse me, of a student to a teacher. So, it is, he's, he's showing him all the affection as he would a teacher, except he is betraying uh, Jesus. Now, in this one, um, it just says one of the disciples strikes um, the guard's ear. Jesus, is, Jesus heals him. Um, and other Gospels, it says Peter. I believe Peter is the one who strikes the guard's ear and heals it. Um, assault. Well, let me back up. Who arrests Jesus? And this is where it gets contentious with anti Semites. The Jewish guards? Yeah, yeah. It it was it was a it was Jewish leaders who arrest Jesus. These are the people who are in the temple courts. They are uh, believed to be Levites, the keeper of the law. The Levites are like a um, civilian army. In that, the Levites, even though they're not a part of the government, they have the power to arrest and charge people. Like a civilian army. They might not have the ability to charge people and convict people, but they have the ability to arrest people on suspicion. So they arrest him. Now Jesus knows that this is a sham. But he has to go through with it. Judas is also the one that Jesus knows is going to do this. Remember what we talked about last week? The Passover meal? And he says, the one I dip in my, in my hand with the cup with is the one who will betray me. And Judas is the one doing it. And I believe there's a lot of symbolism here. We didn't talk about that last week. But the cup was full of salty water. And the salty water symbolizes the tears that the Egyptians shed while they were under slavery. In Egypt, okay? That is symbolic. And so I believe that Jesus, Jesus is saying, you know, you're shedding tears, you're making me shed tears when you do this. And he knows he's going to betray him. 
Judas comes and he, and he gets the religious leaders. The religious leaders, again, have the power to arrest. They do not have the power to convict. So they take him up to Caiaphas, who was the high priest, this night. And then chaos ensues. This is where the disciples go their own way. And as before, we noticed that Jesus, in two of the Gospels, tells the disciples how many times to be awake, stay alert. He told them three times. Peter denies Jesus three times. There's a lot of symbolism in the three. Three can be uh, kind of a revelation kind of uh, symbolism. Seven in the Bible is a complete number. Seven days of the week. Ten is a complete number. Ten commandments. Twelve is a complete number. The twelve disciples. The twelve tribes. Um, Forty is a... Uh, is a long time. It's a long time. Um, so three can equal revelation. Peter finally realizes what he's done after cock crow three times. He had to wake the disciples up three times to get them to, you know, let's go. Therefore, Paul is in darkness when he's on the road to Damascus and Jesus strikes him blind, how many days is he in darkness? And Jesus happens to rise from the dead in three days. Three days. <clears throat> I don't know where I was going with that. Well, I was really good until I couldn't remember what I was doing. Oh, anyway, okay, got it. Um, and the authority to arrest, uh, part of Mark being naked is saying that I was there, John, uh, John Mark, the writer of, of Mark. Um, and also, um, you can, I could go a step further. I like to say this as well, but when you are naked, um, I'm trying not to get too far in the weeds here. When you are naked, you are exposed for every blemish. When you don't have any clothes on, you can see every defect that you have. When God stri stri uh, strips you of your pride, um, of your sin, He spiritually uncloses you. Makes you realize all the defects you have. Just throw that in there. In our nakedness, we realize our shame. Our spiritual nakedness. The whole scene that we see here with the Garden of Gethsemane and in with this betrayal is that there still remains peace in the middle of chaos. Especially here. Jesus gets arrested. The disciples go nuts. Uh, Peter cuts off the ear. Uh, which, by the way, if Jesus doesn't heal uh, the guard's ear, G uh, Peter's probably going to be crucified too. He's going to say, yeah. because... You cannot touch uh, an official like that. Um, and the penalty is severe. So if Jesus doesn't heal the guard's ear, Peter probably dies on a cross too. There's probably four crosses instead of three, we learn the next day. Um, but in the middle of the chaos, Jesus, we find peace in Jesus Christ, who understands his role. And it could have let the disciples fight and draw their swords and you know have a battle. Um, speaking of brave heart, I think about that. I think about that too. Is that there could have been a rebellion. Wallace could have tried everything to leave. Anyone say, who's seen Braveheart? 
all two of you, correct. Um, but William Wallace could have led a rebellion, but instead he took the punishment. Well, he tried to lead a rebellion, but at the end he got caught, but, but he realized he had to go to his death. And this is what Jesus is realizing here, too, is that he has to go to his death. There cannot be any fighting. There cannot be any swords drawn. There has to be um, a crucifixion, and unfortunately he realizes that he is the one that has to go. Okay, next week... Um, Can I... No, there's something way out. Sure. Jesus is portrayed, I mean, Judas is portrayed here as a person that wants money and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, I have heard somebody say he really wanted to force Jesus to come forth as, as a as king. As a messiah. Yeah. As a messiah. And he would sit. You know, I, will, I won't say on the right hand, but right. well, Judas, Judas is the one. Right, Judas is the one who, who wants who wants the right hand, and and but to me, Judas never understands kingdom things. And well, you can and you can make that case for for Peter as well. We didn't talk about this today. Also, is that Peter like never gets the whole story? Like Peter always speaks before he thinks. And he doesn't, that, or, or reacts before he thinks. You know, they go up to the transfiguration, and they see Jesus transfigured, and he said, well, how about we build one for Elijah and one for all of us? And, then, and he doesn't get the, and, and Peter does the same thing when they arrest Jesus. See, Peter doesn't understand the long term, the vision of it. And so the first thing he does is draw a sword, you know, slices off an ear. And he doesn't, he doesn't get that. Um, and in fact, you can make a you can make a really good case for Peter post resurrection, like how Peter was post resurrection, versus how he was pre resurrection. I wasn't saying he wasn't saved. I was just saying that he didn't comprehend everything until the resurrection happens. You can see see this change in Peter. Peter gets it, you know. Um, well, I guess that's true for all of us. Until we see the resurrection, we just don't get it. That'll preach. <laughs> all right. Next week we will go over uh, Friday morning. Now he is, and I didn't get into this text, but he goes before the high priest. Basically the high priest is, let's say in our terms, the grand jury. And the grand jury indicts him. And he is supposed to go before Pilate the next day. And this is where there's a lot of argument as well. Remember we talked about tonight how Jesus didn't want, did Jesus want to go on the cross? And some say yes, and some say no. Um, and there's a huge debate over who really is responsible for Jesus' death. In earthly terms, I guess. Um, what does our Apostles' Creed say? Under Pontius Pilate. Crucified by Was it buried. crucified? It doesn't say crucified by Pontius Pilate. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So that might... We're going to talk a little bit about yeah. that. Um, okay. It could have been the crowd. It could have been mm -hmm. Pontius Pilate. Like Mel Gibson is a staunch believer... When he was interviewed about the passion, Mel Gibson is a staunch believer that Pontius Pilate is the one that is absolutely responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. I'm responsible. We're all responsible. I had, okay. Go I ahead. had a PE teacher in high school who said when people were going along with the crowd, and this is her, if one person in the crowd had said, don't crucify him, it would have made a difference. And I didn't think so. I, I mean, it's a good, that's a good example in a way, but it's not a good example because I don't think that one, I don't think that people were in charge of what was happening. They yeah. weren't, the people weren't the ones who determined what was going to happen. Right. It and was going to happen one way or the other. It might not have happened then, but it would have happened. Right, and and that was um, that's that's a really good point. 
about the crowd and the cross. Because just because the crowd says this is what we ought to do is not right. You know, and that's that now more than ever we have to make a determination as a church, as a body of Christ, as individuals, as a nation, are we going to follow the crowd or are we going to follow the cross? And I've seen that even when we get too much into church politics. Not mm -hmm. local church politics, but denominational politics. It's in the papers. Yeah, and, and it's like, one of the reasons why I left the Methodist church is that I could care less what my bishop said. That just because my bishop said it, I nod and move on and agree. Oh, yeah, I guess that's right. You're right. Man. No. No, and, and, and that's why I say this all the time. Don't, don't nod your head with me and just, cause, just because uh, I said it. Well, the preacher said so and so. No. You go in there and you look yourself. I mean, you can't. You, people can lead you down a hole. And that goes with anything. That goes with the society, that goes with social media, that goes with the church. Even. You have to decide for truth for yourself. So, okay, enough preaching. <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay. All right, next week, Good Friday. All right. Let's pray together. Grace is God because of our sin and our burden. You prayed in a garden to let this cup pass from you. But Lord, you said not your will, but your fathers be done. God, help us to realize each day we are but yours. Just this precious time we have here, let us dedicate it to you. Let us honor you and glorify you with all that we are and all that we have. We ask this all in the mighty name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks guys. We'll see you next week.